Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for, for being here and allowing me to come and present um, my experience with mindfulness to you. My name is Gus Castellanos, and I'm a retired physician. I practiced neurology and sleep medicine in the northern Palm Beach County area for 25 years. And it was in, in those years, particularly back in the 90s, when I was experiencing a lot of job-related stress and eventually what became as, to be known as burnout, which wasn't, the, the term burnout wasn't used that much in physician circles anyway back then, like it is today. Today, physician wellness and burnout is a big topic in healthcare. So I was going through the burnout stage and just coping with, with not so great um, habits. And that's when I came to mindfulness in 1998. A friend of mine at Jupiter Medical Center brought a mindfulness-based stress reduction course to Jupiter Medical Center and invited me to send patients, my patients with insomnia, with pain, uh, with stress, the caregivers taking care of my patients. Because at that point in 1998, the program had been uh, around for 20 years. It originated at the University of Massachusetts School of Medicine in 1979, and it had a lot of research on things like pain, stress, uh, anxiety, and depression. So I was sold, and then I was invited to take the class for my own sake, to see what it, would, what it can do for me. And so I was very privileged and um, lucky, in a way, to have an exposure to it, because it did help me. But I needed to take the course a second time because I didn't follow through on the practices, et cetera, like so many people that come to my classes fall off the practice bandwagon. And so a couple years later, I took the course again. And in the meantime, I started referring uh, pay my patients with different types of neurologic and sleep disorders to the classes, and I was able to see the benefits of mindfulness both in myself and in my patients. And so I really um, came to understand and know what, what it can do, and also where it's not always appropriate. And, and uh, after a few years, I went on and decided to stop practicing medicine in, in 2006. And after meditating more intensively for two more years, I then was offered um, a training at the University of Massachusetts School of Medicine uh, to be trained and eventually got trained and certified to teach mindfulness through their system. So since 2009 to currently, I've been teaching mindfulness all over South Florida. Of course, before the pandemic, there were live classes and I've taught at the major universities, from FAU to NOVA to University of Miami to the medical school to FIU's College of Medicine, as well as just classes to the general um, public. But I have also done special populations like nurses at the Department of Health. The, I, I teach mindfulness. I'm one of the trainers at Children's Services Councils for people that um, are outreach specialists, et cetera, maybe like you all. And also um, firefighters, uh, U.S. soldiers, doctors, medical students, school teachers, generally um, uh, any specific populations, lawyers, corporate, corporate sector. So this is all I do these days. It's sort of my, I would call it my next career, but it's truly more like a passion. And since the pandemic, I've been, I've been blessed that we were able to transfer everything onto the Zoom platform and similar platforms. And so I continue to teach. So it's a real honor to be presenting my experience and the knowledge on mindfulness. And hopefully um, that you will find out for yourself how useful it might be in your life and in those around you. So I'm also very honored to be teaching this for you, knowing what you all do for a living and knowing that we've been under very stressful times. And I'm sure the people you work for and work with have been going through a lot of stress. And this is where mindfulness has really been very, very useful for so many because it not only helps reduce the anxiety and the stress and the depression, but it builds resilience. And I'm sure you've gone through some of this. And so today what I plan to do on this hour presentation is review basically what mindfulness is and some of the research in the, in the brain science and then lead a 10 minute fundamental um, practice of mindfulness called focused attention. And then after that, just offer a number of um, techniques, tools that you can do throughout your day, what I call informal and short mindfulness practices that you can also offer to others if they're interested. 
uh, with some caveats on when, what you should do or not do if you're going to lead others in some mindfulness, and then end with a very, very brief discussion on where mindfulness should not be used and what the potential risks are. So again, thank you for allowing me to be here and thank you for your work in the world. I really appreciate what you do. So let's begin with what mindfulness is not. I think it's important to know what this is not. And as you can see from the slide, this is not a um, breathing exercise and attempt to control the breath. It's not a religion. It's not an attempt to quiet the mind, to relax the body, to achieve an altered state. It's also not some kind of dogma or intellectual exercise or a belief system. Lots of people think mindfulness is about quieting, emptying the mind of all thoughts or achieving a calm state. So the, the idea behind mindfulness, for what it is, is first, it's an innate capacity we all have within us. All humans have the capacity to be mindful, to be aware, to pay attention. So it is a disposition and also a state we can achieve to be more attentive in this moment uh, so that state can be cultivated by doing the practices. So it's an innate capacity we have that we're trying to bring forth with our practicing of mindfulness. But defining mindfulness has been very difficult. There is no one definition of all the research that's been done, which I'll discuss in a moment. And for the per people practicing mindfulness for many, many years, uh, there has never been one definition that says this is what mindfulness is. What I like to say is that mindfulness is being in the present moment, aware of what's happening in the present moment, within you and around you, as it's happening, and also cultivating positive qualities. The one we use the most is being non-judgmental, but other people use friendliness, curiosity, kindness. So it's being in the present moment, aware of what's happening in the present moment as it's happening, while keeping, maintaining a non-judgmental, friendly attitude. And it's a way to really be with what's, what's occurring, particularly the unpleasantness that arises so often in our lives, especially these days, and perhaps with the people you work with, um, to see what, what um, to see clearly what's actually happening rather than what we prefer not happening or what we wish was. And we do this because we will be training our brain. You're using our attention and our minds to train our brains for these, um, uh, to be staying present, to, um, to gain that clarity and insight. So mindfulness is primarily, in my mind, a, an experience-based practice. Millions of people that have now practiced mindfulness will, will vouch for the fact that it's a, it had helped them. So um, first and foremost, from the direct experience of so many people, that's why it's become so popular. But undoubtedly, the popularity has also been because of the research. And as you can see on this slide, over the last 20 years, there's been an exponential rise in research. Now, this is the type of research that is we considered peer-reviewed scientific clinical research. I'm not talking about here articles in Time magazine or yoga um, uh, magazines, that kind of thing. This is very, very um, uh, good research done by clinicians and scientists of all types. And just to point out, the graph starts in 1980. The, the program that we think that um, started all of the mindfulness trend, trend at the University of Massachusetts School of Medicine through which I'm trained, um, that you can see that there is very little research done for the first 20 years, but once people really started to get the experience, they started um, going ahead and uh, bring it into their professional lives and researching it, and there's where it's been the explosion of research. And I'm going to only review this very, very quickly. I know the slide may look a little busy, it's not so much about the details, but just suffice it to say, the four domains of well-being is how I separate out where the research um, shows uh, the, the uh, benefits uh, of mindfulness. Uh, beginning with the physical health side, very early on it was clear that mindfulness can be very useful for pain. Pain uh, of all types, low back pain, arthritic pain, migraines, uh, and especially the chronic pain that was so disabling for so many. 
Uh, so we knew right away, and we still see how useful it is for, for people with chronic pain. Uh, but it also helps with the immune system. It reduces the uh, stress hormones, which influences, which, which negatively impact on the immune system. So through that mechanism, our immune is bolstered in this day and age with the uh, pandemics that we're facing, that we may face in the future. It's really important to have a good immune system. And it does things at a, a, a um, genetic level. There was some reason it was found to, uh, people looked at this, very interesting, that working on these practices of mindfulness will, will affect your genes, particularly inflammation genes and the so-called telomeres, which have to do with cell aging. And then finally, you can probably find mindfulness um, classes and practices and programs that have done for pretty much all uh, medical diseases, uh, but certainly for diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, chronic fatigue, irritable bowel syndrome, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, epilepsies, migraines, uh, mindfulness has been shown to be helpful. That said, though, the most impactful research has been by far in the mental health domain. Uh, because it helps with emotion regulation, um, and if we're doing, if you will, practices with our mind, uh, the the um, mental health improvement has been quite obvious and very robust uh, research that has been replicated over and over. So very useful for depression, anxiety, insomnia, and relapse prevention in people with substance use disorders, as well as just the general stress. We see this very useful also in people with cancer, undergoing cancer diagnosis, cancer treatment, uh, and the caregivers that are taking care of other people that are um, uh, having lots of problems to take care of themselves. Hence, it's so useful in what you do for a living. Uh, also, mindfulness is a pro-social practice. We, as you may know, that we are social beings. We have social brains. We do better. We thrive uh, with connections with others. Uh, but you'll see in a moment that mindfulness uh, improves or enhances the areas of the brains that have to do with compassion and empathy and attunement, and this is particularly um, important when we're dealing with the younger um, people, uh, attuning to their, our nervous systems with their nervous system uh, to, to regulate each other. When someone is dysregulated, we can use our nervous systems to regulate theirs, and mindfulness helps with that. But it really does impact, very impactful on empathy and compassion. And then finally, the productivity, the reason why I think mindfulness is so popular in the corporate sector is because it helps with concentration, focus, and memory, as well as creativity and thinking outside the box. Mindfulness is a practice that will reduce our rumination, especially their negative self-talk and mind wandering, and that's also very useful uh, for people uh, that are doing desk jobs and working every day, whatever that may be. So it helps the cognitive skills. And a large part of how that works and a large part of the research that has made mindfulness very popular, and I'm not saying this because I'm biased as a neurologist though, is the fact that there have been lots of brain studies. The neuroscience of mindfulness has shown that people who practice mindfulness will change the brain in a particular way. There is the science of neuroplasticity, which means the brain changes, especially due to experience. Anything we do over and over and over will change the brain in that direction. So uh, the more you, one practices mindfulness, the more the so-called benefits that you will be getting. And so here's how mindfulness changes the brain. But I do want to say one little word of caution. The, the, the neuroscience of mindfulness that I'm talking about here is a relatively new science, as much as they know, as much as we know so far. So these, these um, uh, things I'm saying here might be changing over the next few years. So just to give you a ballpark though, this is what I found consistently over the last 10 years, that when we practice mindfulness, the areas of the brain that have to do with concentration, attention, critical thinking, rationality, impulse control, and planning, which is called the prefrontal cortex, which is up in front of the brain, uh, it's the last part of our brain to be developed, usually by the age of 25. That part of the brain is, is much enhanced by practicing mindfulness, so it leads to better attention, impulse control, better critical thinking, rational thinking. Other parts of the brains that it improves are going to be the memory centers, 
and the areas for compassion, empathy, and learning. On the other hand, the areas of the brain that it reduces are primarily two. One is something called the amygdala, and the amygdala is a deep part of the brain uh, in what is called the limbic system or the emotional part of the brain. It's reference, uh, referred to quite often as the alarm center. It's what triggers our stress response, our fight or flight response. And so particularly in people with uh, significant anxiety disorders and panic attacks and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, the amygdala is hyperactive. It's, it's actually larger than in uh, non-anxious people. And so uh, this is why you see people with anxiety trigger anxiety and panic very easily, and PTSD people are hypervigilant. So mindfulness practices reduces that part of the brain. And the other part of the brain is called, it's actually a, a network, not, not one area. It's called the default mode network. And this is the area of the brains, uh, the network of the brains that we um, default to when we're not doing anything and our mind begins to wander. And if you've experienced mind wandering, you know that many times it will go into self-referential, especially self-critical, self-judgmental thinking and time traveling, mental time traveling into the future and into the past. In other words, out of the present moment. So of course, when we're practicing mindfulness to be in the present moment, uh, that part of the brain is also reduced. So it improves these in important areas of the brain and decreases these other uh, areas. And that alone to me is um, a big explanation for how mindfulness is um, beneficial. With the, um, with the idea though is that it doesn't always look the same to all people. So because your so-called prefrontal cortex, the area for creativity, planning, rationality, is enhanced does not mean that you'll have the exact same outcomes in your world, in your life, that somebody else's will. But it will be for your benefit. I think that's the real power of mindfulness. So, and so I'm going to lead a practice here in a moment, and the practices that we do are just very simple. And so there's this practice that's a fundamental practice of mindfulness it's called focused attention. And what we'll be doing is choosing an object, and I use the body a lot because it's so practical. Um, presumably, wherever you go, your body goes with you. So we can choose areas of the bodies to bring our attention to. And then when we notice that the mind wanders away and gets distracted, which happens to all of us, you just note that. And without judging and giving yourself a hard time, you remember to bring your attention back to the object. And we do that again and again and again. And that's the simplicity of some of these practices, which sometimes is what throws people off. It's just too simple to be helpful, but by experience, that's actually how it works. And so, so let's begin. Now, keep in mind, this is optional, of course. It's not possible to force anybody to practice mindfulness, but if you care to join me, this 10-minute practice will be focused attention by picking a, a choosing an object in our body and bringing our attention to that object. So let's begin simply by grounding the body on the seat that you're on. Feeling that sense of contact with the seat, feeling grounded, and then elongating upright. Allowing the eyes to close, allowing the gaze, it's always your choice. And if you choose to close the eyes, feel free to open the eyes during the practice if that's what you feel is necessary. And scanning the body, making any adjustments that may be necessary so that you're in a posture that supports balance, comfort, stability. Calling to mind a sense of dignity, whatever dignity means to you, and embody that sense of dignity. So sitting grounded, upright, and dignified. And then becoming aware of the fact that you're breathing. Just noticing the breath as it is. There's no need to manipulate or change. Improve, deepen the breath. Breathing in, knowing the breath coming into the body. Breathing out, knowing the breath leaving the body, breath by breath. And 
now choosing the, we call them anchors, choosing the anchors. And the most common anchor is the breath. Wherever in the body you're feeling the breath the most, for most people that'll be the belly or the nostrils. But for you it might be the chest, the throat, or the back body. And then whenever you find that part of the body where the breath is most prominent, most vivid, bring the attention to the sensations of the breath in that part of the body. So at the belly, it would be rising on the in-breath, falling on the out-breath. At the chest, expanding, contracting. At the nostrils, perhaps a tingling vibration the air moving across the nostrils or the flare, the expansion of the nostrils on the in-breath that releases on the out-breath. And if the breath is challenging for you, if you're having some um, trouble with efforting, too much effort, or it's causing anxiety, feeling a little dysregulated from the breath, know that that is okay. It's not a problem. We see this a lot actually with the pandemic because probably quote, because COVID is a, a respiratory virus. If that's the case, other places to bring your attention to the hands and fingers, whatever sensations are present in the hands and fingers or the feet or the body making contact with the seat that you're on. So taking a moment to find which anchor best supports your practice today, and then making that the object for the remainder of this short practice. It's likely that you've noticed the mind's habit of wandering away from the practice, away from the present moment. The mind could be maybe getting lost in thought, caught up in a story, distracted by some sounds or unpleasant body sensations. If that's the case, you know that that is not a problem. It's actually very common, it happens to all of us. You're not failing or doing something wrong. There's no need to feel disappointed, depressed, or defeated if that's happening, even if it's happening a lot. You just need to know that that's happening, and that's actually a moment of mindfulness. So you really can't fail at this. And then always remembering gently and firmly, return the attention back to the anchor that you've chosen with that friendly, non judgmental attitude. Doing that again and again. Noticing where the mind is right now. Where's your attention? 
Is it on your anchor that you've chosen? Or is it somewhere else, some other time in the future, in the past? Or maybe getting sleepy and actually falling asleep or bored, spacing out, looking for something else to do. So many different mind states that can happen. Again, not a problem. Just note that that's happened and return the attention back to the practice, back to the moment. You're not giving yourself a hard time. Many times as the mind wanders away from the practice, that many times bringing it back. For every time that the mind wanders away and you acknowledge that thought, feeling, distraction, and you remember to come back and return the attention back the practice, you're strengthening your mindfulness. And you're learning to step back. To step back from the thoughts and feelings into the clear, open space of mind. So as we come to an end of this short practice, coming back to the breath, noticing your breath now, keeping in mind, as we say in our classes, as long as you're breathing, there's more right with you than wrong with you, no matter what's wrong. So recognizing that and taking a moment to congratulate yourself for this brief practice, whatever you did, not worrying about what you could have done, what you think you did wrong, appreciating yourself for this brief practice. Whenever you're ready, lifting the gaze, opening the eyes, and returning the attention back to the screen, to the classroom. Checking in with your body if it needs to move or shift, feel free to do so. Thank you. All right, so as important and useful and um, um, uh, the research and all the benefits that we talked about with the brain changes and the calming of the nervous system and whatever you might have felt from the short practice, really another, I, I think almost as, as much, if not more, powerful attribute of practicing mindfulness is this, um, how we learn to sit with discomfort, physical, emotional, or mental discomfort, instead of doing what we normally do, which is run away from the things we don't like, or try to cover up, or deny, or worse, get into maladaptive coping. So with mindfulness, we learn to sit with discomfort little by little, for sure. But the reason why that's important is because we find that um, running away from, denying, wanting to change, fussing with what you're feeling can actually make you suffer more, if you will. You will feel worse by doing that rather than just leaving it alone. But at the same time, by being able to be with the discomfort, we, we build resilience. 
where, where our ability to cope with these thoughts and emotions that become overwhelming uh, and difficult um, increases when we practice like this. So we don't shut down or become overwhelmed every time something goes wrong. And because we improve our concentration and our memory and we reduce the rumination and mind wandering, we're able to handle the problems as, as they arise for us uh, over and over. And we just do this by the simple practice. It allows us also when we run into um, problems or failures that we don't get so upset that we just give up. We get back up and start over again. And so there's what resilience is more or less, so we, what we think is resilience, it's really the ability to bounce back from adversity. As you can see on the bottom of the slide, the people have been, it's been tested out, people with higher mindfulness have greater resilience and that leads to an increased life satisfaction. And how this happens, um, it's technically hard to explain, but it has a lot to do with just simply what I call the power of the pause. Pausing, particularly when we're triggered, activated, dysregulated, we're not feeling comfortable, pausing. And in that pause, we create a space. In that space, instead of reacting out of our habits, which may or may not be useful, and commonly over time, especially to the negative um, events that happen in our life, these reactions um, tend to get us in trouble. So it's not the actual uh, event, situation, or other person that triggers us that causes the issue. It's how we perceive them and then how we've, we've learned to react to that uh, habitually over time. That, that's how we get in trouble. So if we can pause for a moment, and then we have an opportunity to choose a response, a healthier, wiser, more skillful response. So this is what we say is the... Um, self-awareness that comes from practicing mindfulness leads to the self-regulation and the emotional regulation which of course leads to self-care and that's what fosters resiliency so the um, pausing can be done in many different ways and i'm going to show you one way here now but uh, we'll go on and show you a couple other ways but if you can see on the triangle this is what we call the triangle of awareness which are the body sensations the emotions and the thinking that is the body, the mind, and the heart in our world. Uh, again, simply pausing rather than reacting. Even if you choose the same reaction, doing so with mindful awareness will always have a better outcome than when, when it's done mindlessly. Great, so thank you. So we'll do this brief triangle of awareness practice. It's only three to five minutes here. So if you care to join me, Allowing the eyes to close or lowering the gaze, whichever you prefer. And then bringing the attention to where the body is making contact with the seat that you're on, feeling into that sense of groundedness. If the feet are on the floor, the same thing, grounding the feet. You may even want to press the feet or the body into the floor or the chair. Really feel that sense of being grounded. And also that sense of being supported. You're supported by the seat that you're on, by the floor of the building you're in. Which of course is supported by the earth. And then from those areas of contact, of groundedness, it allow the attention to expand to the entire body. So bringing the attention to the body from head to toe, side to side, front to back, and getting a sense for how the body's feeling right now. What's the condition of the body? Is it feeling energized or fatigued? Restless, calm, tight, loose? Is it cool, warm, or neutral temperature? Are there any strong sensations throughout the body? Sense of being at ease, being relaxed. Just noticing the overall condition of the body. How's the body feeling?
whatever you're noticing in the body, whatever, the, whatever it's feeling like, just acknowledging it all, letting it all be. And then bringing the attention to the heart center, the heart space, or wherever you feel emotions. You might be noticing emotions that are very strong and obvious or very subtle, very soft. There may be pleasant emotions or unpleasant emotions, mixed emotions. And of course, there may be no emotions. You can also notice your mood here. You're in a good mood or bad mood or neutral. So if we say, how is it in the heart? Whatever that, whatever's going on in the heart, whatever emotions and mood, whatever they're like, just letting it all be, coming to the mind. Checking in with the mind. Is it full of thoughts or mostly empty of thoughts? Just noticing how is it in the mind? Letting all that be, so having done the brief triangle of awareness, emotions, thoughts, body sensations, coming to the breath. Just noticing the breath as it is. And when you're ready, with an awareness of doing so, lifting the gaze, opening the eyes. And bringing the attention back to the classroom. Thank you. And that's that. All right, so that was a brief practice, a drop in practice. You can see it here on the slide. It's called the mindful check in, the triangle of awareness, the thoughts, emotions, and sensations in the body. And we use the wording body, mind, and heart. And just to notice how it is. It's very useful practice to do when you're triggered and activated, but it can be used at any time when you're feeling okay or just in a neutral mood. And even quicker is the one that you see here called the brief check-in. This is borrowed from um, the hospitals and the nurses who use this to know, to ask a patient what their pain's like. And you can just check your mood very, very um, instantly, many times throughout the day. It's a practice of bringing the attention to the present moment and into you, how you're feeling, without having to analyze or figure out. Um, and that may help you to get a feel for how you're doing throughout the day. And then we have these other short practices uh, to remind us also we can take a breath, pause and notice our breath. Uh, we use these two little metaphors with the stop sign, or be, because we, I do work enough with the people in recovery and uh, from drugs and alcohol, uh, we can use this, the acronym of SOBER. And, but they're the same. It's really basically just pause for a moment, check in with the breath, observe what's going on, and then go, and then proceed with whatever you're doing. Very useful, quick practices that are sprinkled throughout the day. And during the pandemic, we used what we do, what we're supposed to be doing anyway, commonly, washing our hands, making that a practice, putting on our masks, putting on the masks and our children, being very aware of what we're doing with our body as we do this. The, the key here, um, the simple suggestion is just bringing the attention to the body. So when you're washing your hands or placing the sanitizer, um, just notice the sensations on the skin, the warmth of the water, the lather, the, the uh, coolness of the Purell, even the smell of the Purell. All of these things can just hold our attention here in the present moment, and you'll be doing it with, um, with more skill, especially when we're doing it for putting the mask on. Very important to be careful how we put the masks on. So um, we can adapt these practices to whatever's going on, and we can really bring these mindful moments into our everyday life. Anything we do throughout the day, we can bring attention to that. We call these many mindful moments, and it's important to realize that the, the major researchers and teachers do not, do not really know what type of practices, how long we're supposed to practice 
mindfulness to get the benefits and to have those brain changes and have, get the, um, the results that you're looking for. What people, what we all think and what we all know from experience is that the more moments of mindfulness you have during the day, the more those benefits and changes in the brain and nervous system and such will occur. So anytime you're doing anything, you can bring your attention to what you're doing. Again, I suggest strongly just come to your body. So when you're walking, and we walk so much throughout our day, bring attention to the soles of the feet making contact. Just feel the contact. Nothing else needs to be done. When you're, so I did the awareness of breath. When you're eating, you have an opportunity to use your all five, all five senses, actually. Look at the food. Really just look without analysis. And also smell. Of course, taste the food. You will also um, have some sensations uh, when, you, when you put it against your lips, when you hold them, perhaps you're holding something in your hand. And then anything like showering, brushing your teeth, folding laundry, cooking, washing dishes, all of these activities by simply bringing the attention to the body can be um, moments of mindfulness that will add up throughout the day. And so you can, you can choose to do formal practice, sit for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, uh, do a laying down meditation, whatever, whatever, you, whatever your preferences are. But you can also enhance that uh, with these short practices. And in many of the populations I deal with, such as um, interns and medical residents at the uh, university hospitals, the mindful moments actually work out better because they really are a bunch for time. They don't have time to even do a 10-minute practice. So people find them, and we, and we can make them personal as to exactly what you're doing. So for them, there are specific practices that have to do with being a doctor. And then you see here the self-compassion break which is a mindful self-compassion break that uses mindfulness, but uh, is, takes it to a next level. So self-compassion is something that we all should be practicing, we think. There's been a lot of research lately on the benefits of practicing compassion for self and others on our physiology, on our psychology, what it does to our stress hormones, um, what it does for our, um, uh, our way of being, especially how we relate to others. So we all deserve to have compassion. Uh, and, and, and so the self-compassion is that much more important. And it, you may or may not find it surprising, but here in the West, especially in the United States, people have a hard time offering some compassion and kindness to themselves. They place themselves at the bottom of the list of um, th those that, we, that they want to offer compassion, kindness, um, and help. And that's one of the reasons why we see people in the helping professions as well as personal caregivers get burnt out. So compassion is an antidote to those as well as using mindfulness. And we'll see in a moment a short practice. But again, all human beings deserve compassion. And it's, it's a, compared to self-esteem, it's something that is not necessarily associated with a specific talent trait, intellectual accomplishment, um, with how you look, uh, anything like that. It really is just simply because you're human. And the, um, uh, uh, the ability to practice self-compassion is always available in this moment. Compared to, for instance, self-esteem, let's say um, you, you were taking a test and you didn't do well in the test, it's always that you can do better, try harder and do better next time. The self-compassion just says, be okay with that right now. And doing so like that, the research has shown that people actually do better in the future rather than be thinking about how I'm going to do better and struggling because that adds a little bit more pressure. So again, everybody deserves to have, um, to have deserves compassion, and in self-compassion, it's very um, uh, common that we we put ourselves last on the list. So that's why we should focus on that first. And as you can see here, these are what we call the circles of compassion, beginning with ourselves. We can then extend it out to the people we work for, work with, our family members, and then extend further to the people in our communities and then eventually to maybe the whole planet. We can all use a lot more compassion in this world. And this is the self-compassion break, mindful self-compassion break. It comes from the mindful self-compassion research and work of Kristen Neff and Chris Germer. 
very popular eight-week courses now being adapted to shorter courses that are very, very popular these days. So th in this break, whenever you're feeling upset, particularly if you get sad and you feel like you've done something wrong or somebody's been treating you wrong, if you feel ashamed, um, sad, and certainly when you're feeling anxious, and even when you're angry, you can pause and do this really quick practice. It has three components. The first one is the mindfulness component. Acknowledge that that is happening to you. This is a challenging moment. This is a difficult moment. This is a really tough thing I'm going through. Labeling actually does something right then that diffuses some of the energy. It's called decoupling. The psychologists call this decoupling or decentering. Stepping back rather than being caught up in and um, all, all hijacked by the emotions, we can step back and sometimes we say, name it to tame it. This is a moment of suffering. This is a moment of sadness. This is a moment of um, challenge. That alone can help, and it does. But then we extend it further and say, and then bring to mind the fact that you're not the only person in the world that's having a hard time right now. Everybody has hard times sometimes in their life. So the common humanity angle is to say, for instance, um, everybody suffers. Suffering is part of life. So the first step, acknowledge that it's happening. This is a moment of suffering. Second step, suffering is part of life. Everybody suffers. And then the third step is offering yourself the kindness and compassion. I like to say something like, uh, may I give myself what I need right now? So I don't have to figure out what I'm supposed to do. I just ask the question and see what, what arises. And then just listen to your own inner wisdom. But you certainly can do anything that feels right for you. Some people place their hands on their heart, give themselves a hug. Um, some people take some deep breath, take a walk, go out to nature. Or be assertive. If you're in a situation, pause and just you know, get yourself together and say, I need to confront this head on. But it's your, coming from you and you're determining how it is that you should take care of this situation. So very, very, um, very powerful little practice. Whenever you're feeling in this negative, unpleasant way, pause, recognize that it's happening, remember that you're not alone, you're not the only one that's doing that, and then offering yourself this, a, a, anything that makes you feel better in that moment. And then go ahead and proceed with whatever you're doing. So that's great. And also that tends to do what we call regulate our own nervous system. For now, I'm going to um, talk about how you can bring mindfulness to others that you may be working with or even family members. Because in the professions that you're at and in just everyday life, if you're not aware of what you're experiencing and you're not that in tune to what the, act of the person in front of you is actually experiencing, you will pick up um, their negative energy, if you will. This is where we get into what was called vicarious trauma. If repeatedly hearing the stories and feeling into what people are going through, how much trauma and suffering they're going through, we can pick it up. And if we're not aware, we then have as much trauma as they do. But certainly, it can lead to burnout. Caregiver burnout is a, a very well-known phenomenon as well as what we call compassion or empathy fatigue, empathy distress. From being too empathetic, we get distressed and, and then we start feeling bad and then we're no good to, to the other person. So um, when, when it's what we call the cost of caring for others, that we have risk for these things and we can bring the antidotes of mindfulness and the self-compassion together to help us get through these. So that said, if you're going to be offering mindfulness to others, these are some simple suggestions that I've come up with. Keep it optional because it's not meant for everybody. Do not force mindfulness onto anybody. You cannot make anyone practice mindfulness. It has to be optional, but keep it simple, keep it fun. Do simple things like we just went over here. Um, mind, take mindful breaks, beginning and end of sessions. Taking a mindful moment at the beginning of a meeting has been a real useful thing for many people, especially in the corporate world. It really centers everybody's attention into the meeting. Uh, and of course, during charge moments, take that pause. 
And then when you um, are doing it with a group of people, especially if you've done it a few times, allow the students or the clients to lead. That makes it a lot fun and they're much more engaged that way. But the biggest thing I can suggest is to make sure that you embody mindfulness yourself. It is a real, it's impossible and it's actually harmful if you're trying to get people to do mindfulness, to pause, to pay attention to their breath or whatever practice you want to lead. If you're not experienced in doing that yourself, it's going to come out awkward, um, wrong, inappropriate, and even harmful. It really can lead to harm if you're not sure what you're doing. So please, if you're going to pass it on, make sure you've done some of the practices yourself. And so here are just a few suggestions. Anything that we just went over here a few minutes ago, you're welcome to try with somebody else. Uh, and you're working here, particularly with um, children and teens, simple things like stopping to pay attention to the breath using the STOP acronym. When we use words like playing attention or we're training the mind like we're training a puppy. So just using words, you can make, and make it up very straightforward, common sense. You can bring mindfulness to any sensation in the body. The five senses, you can be creative. So with the body sensations, if somebody's lying down, feeling the contact of the body, uh, with same thing with sitting, standing, sounds very useful, especially for kids. Just what are you hearing? What are the noises? And you can also take it to what are you actually listening to? And then of course, smells and sights and tastes. Um, just I find you'll know with the population you're dealing with, whoever you're trying to get across to, what their interests are. Um, and you can make it, make it fun, make it simple. Uh, during, while, while mindfulness during movement, you can do it while people are walking, like we went over before, running or move, doing some stretching. And you can bring it into sports and uh, recess. We found that very useful at a um, summer camp for under-resourced teens that I work with, that the teenagers started bringing mindfulness into their soccer playing and such. So very, um, very simple techniques that can be used. And then here's a specific program. My good friend and fellow mindfulness teacher, uh, Professor Scott Rogers at the University of Miami Law School, who's been teaching mindfulness actually to the law students for the last 10 years, he actually wrote a book called So Be Mindful. And it's very simple with a lot of illustrations. And I believe to me, it's like one of the most uh, powerful, simplest programs. And here it is in a nutshell. So he also brought in the attributes of nature. Uh, so this is useful for adults as well as kids, but kids really like this. When you're working with the kids, um, when, when, when they feel the, the wind, that becomes associated with the breath. So feel the wind, and that means noticing the breath. When you see a tree, notice your body. When you see the clouds, notice your mind, your thoughts. So that's just being with the breath, body, and thoughts. You can also make it working with the breath, the body, and the thoughts. So when you feel the wind, take a breath, deepen the breath, improve the breath. When you see a tree, strengthen, a, a straight, straighten your posture or stretch if you need to. When you see the clouds, change your thoughts if you're having unpleasant negative thoughts. So you can be with or work with the breath, the body, and the thoughts. Uh, by using nature. And then the sun has the two connotations. It can be thought of as awareness itself, that is always, the sun is always shining, even when, the, when it's clouded over, it's still in the background. Awareness is always here. But also you can use it as the compassion, kindness um, uh, at, uh, metaphor, the warmth and the light of compassion that comes from the sun. So very simple. And he has a book on it, uh, it's called So Be Mindful by Scott Rogers. It just it, it mostly illustrates these. And so then one final um, thing I feel is important to get across, I think we'll, we'll start seeing more and more about this in, uh, over the next few years, uh, beginning with minding the hype. As much as you're hearing all the benefits, even what I suggested today and you may have learned in your course, um, mindfulness is not a cure-all and it's not a panacea. It is not for everything, as, as, as much as you might find on the internet that mindfulness helps with, with just about any problem that you might have. Uh, it really isn't going to be helpful for everything. And it's also not for everyone. 
And generally what we say are the people who are having some major psychological issues, they shouldn't be practicing mindfulness because you're bringing awareness to the problem. So people with um, untreated, non unprocessed trauma, especially bad PTSD, um, people who are grieving a lot, that are still having a hard time grieving, it's really hard to sit with the grieving. Uh, if they're, obvious things are if they're psychotic or abusing drugs and alcohol, suicidal, shouldn't be doing mindfulness. And then there are some people that for religious reasons, um, are, it's not for them. And, and you, that should be honored. It really should not be forced upon everybody. So it's not for everything, it's not for everyone, and it's not the only thing. If you're going to um, be using mindfulness for your pain or your anxiety, stay with your doctors and your therapists and your physical therapy programs. Um, and it's not, these practices are not instead of usual care. In fact, usual care and mindfulness go together very well. The therapist will tell you when they practice mindfulness, when they um, offer mindfulness to their clients as well as their therapy, the sessions go that much better. And then sometimes it's just not the right time. It's just sometimes hard to do some of these practices right now in the moment, too many things going on, too busy life. Uh, so um, again, not for everything, not for everyone, not the only thing and not now. Uh, and then finally, there's also side effects. So these are not talked about much and partly is because of the commercialization of mindfulness that um, side effects are bad for business, so just to be straight up. But also, just as important in the research, it was, the side effects are not, the, the negative adverse effects are not looked for. They're not systematically looked for, so they're underreported. I can tell you from doing this for so many years, what happens when people come to my programs that are, let's say, six weeks or eight weeks long, and something goes wrong, they usually just drop out on their own, and we may never know why they dropped out. They may have had a serious problem, but they just thought they were doing something wrong. It wasn't for them. They dropped out. They got back to their regular life and, you know, no long-term um, side effects. But what we're talking about here are mostly the exacerbation of underlying psychological issues, like I was saying before, with un untreated trauma. Rarely somebody who has not, who has forgotten the trauma or the, the abuse or whatever may have happened. It's very, very bur buried in their head. And when they practice mindfulness and awareness, just sitting still, that tends to bubble up. So it's usually, almost always, 99% of the time, something that's already there that comes out. Rarely does practicing mindfulness trigger a brand new psychological issue. Uh, and you can have physical problems. They're very common sense. When you're teaching someone to sit for long periods of time, you're going to feel uh, different aches and pains. So most of the time when we see these problems, it's under, uh, under the conditions of long-term silent retreats, not in these classes that we do, not for these 10 minutes practices, but you just need to be aware of them. And then finally, if it does happen, this really does require an experienced meditation teacher or therapist or both to offer a patient-centered approach, to really to say to them, what is the patient actually all about? Not just what the meditation practice or, the, or their psychology is about, but the culture they're from, their interests, their belief systems. So just making you aware that it can happen. It's very, very rare in our everyday mindfulness classes, though. And so finally, then, to just review, um, mindfulness is an innate capacity we all have. We're not teaching you a new skill. We're not bringing you a new, um, something new that you have to learn. We're just bringing forth that capacity to pay attention in the present moment. So I like to say that we're using our attention and our mind to train our brain, to change our brain, to then train and change the mind and heart for the benefit of ourselves and others. And we do that by simply bringing attention, particularly to what we're experiencing, and without judging, without criticizing, without giving ourselves a hard time, just being with it to the, so that we can then choose um, how to respond to what's happening in healthier, more skillful, more beneficial ways. Uh, we get to really experience our life on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So it's not so much a practice that we're doing, it's a way of life and a way of relating to that which is happening in our lives. So thank you for your kind attention for this presentation.
really appreciate uh, the opportunity to offer you and um, discuss the, uh, the experience I've had with mindfulness over the years, working with so many people, and more so, especially for what I know that you all do for a living um, and, and what you must be doing for your families as well. I really appreciate you all for doing that. Thank you so much. And finally, um, if you care to, I have my um, maybe 15 different meditation recordings of different lengths from about 10 minutes to about 40 minutes. They're available for you on my website. You can see the, um, the web address here. It's called innerinmate.com. And I also have a YouTube channel, if that works better. Just um, YouTube my name and mindfulness, and it should come up and give you the whole list. And then finally, I really, really do welcome feedback, questions, comments, even complaints. Whatever you want to say, I'm, I'm here for you. This is all I do for a living, so feel free to contact me. Here's my email and my phone number. Uh, I welcome that. And like I say in all my classes, you cannot bother me as much as I was bothered when I practiced medicine. So please feel free to contact me anytime. And once again, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this opportunity and for all you do. Thank you.